Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh year of the Tallgrass Artist Residency. My name is Kelly Yarbrough, and I serve as the lead administrator for the residency program. I want to take a few minutes to tell you about this program and introduce you to a few of the folks that made today possible. But first, I want to take a moment to acknowledge some things about the place where we're gathered. I hope that it's pretty clear to those of you who are visiting today that this building and this community are steeped in history. If you're lucky, you might talk with someone today who's lived here long enough to remember the doodle bug, which was apparently a small little passenger rail car that shuttled people from town to town on rail lines in the Flint Hills. Fun fact, ask someone about it. There's a wealth of memory and memories in this area, and I hope that you seek out someone new to meet today and listen to their stories. But it was past Tallgrass resident, Cherokee, Madame Mesquite artist, Mara Garcia, who first voiced to me the present absence that she felt from indigenous voices in this place. Sure, she found signs and plaques that spoke about indigenous peoples, but she couldn't find all that much evidence of engagement with indigenous voices today. Addressing that kind of void takes time and relationship building, but I think of the folks that are here in this room today and the folks who are in Matfield Green creating spaces, some of them physical spaces, programs, events, meals, and I see a lot of allies in this work. I also learned from Mora that speaking names has power. So I want to acknowledge that lands we're occupying today were the ancestral homes of the Osage, Sioux, and Kickapoo peoples, also supported communities of Ka, Comanche, and Wichita peoples, among others. It's my hope that the Tallgrass Artist Residency and our partners can continue making space for indigenous voices and for an expansive understanding of the many forces that have shaped and continue to shape this place in the Flint Hills that we all love. So very briefly, I do want to tell you about what this Tallgrass Artist Residency program is about. Every year we do an open call for applications from artists of all disciplines, uh, and a rotating jury of panelists helps us narrow down finalists from a pool of about 200. The residency is funded by the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts, which makes it possible for us to keep these applications free for artists and to provide each of them with lodging and a modest stipend to offset costs. The Tallgrass Artist Residency prioritizes artists living in the Prairie Eco region, which makes for a lot of fun map checking along the way. <laughs> but in recent years, we've also added eco exchange residents from places that are beyond the Prairie region. We seek artists who are interested in exploring this place as defined by its land, its cultures, its stories, not just its political boundaries. Each artist that joins us is awarded 10 nights of lodging at Matfield Station. They're asked to give one public program during their stay. They're given a list of people and places they might want to check out, but otherwise the residency is totally self-guided. We bring all of these artists back together in Matfield Green for this weekend of events. And this is the time when we ask them to share out a bit more about their experiences during the residency. Um, and this year, just so everyone knows, we have shifted our application schedule to be in the fall. So our applications for the 2023 program are actually open right now. Um, those are all online. You can find them on our website at tallgrassartistresidency.org. And the deadline to apply is October 31st. So please check that out. So I've been pretty surprised over the years by how many incredible artists are hungry to come to spend time in rural Kansas. But if you've spent any amount of time in Matfield Green, I think it becomes a little less surprising why. The community members here consistently welcome and show up for visiting artists in lots of different ways, offering meals, back road drives, vegetables from the garden. The residency program doesn't have its own building, but we exist through local partnerships. 
And I think that's one of the things that I'm most pleased with about this program. We've got a pretty small footprint, but we're deeply tied to the people who live here. In other words, we're small and we're proud of it. Did I get that right, Matt Pilgreen? <laughs> cool. So uh, I'm gonna invite Matt Regeer on stage in just a moment here to talk about the building that we're in and, and what they're doing. Um, I do want to give a shout out to a couple of other folks who make the Tallgrass residency possible year in and year out. Um, first, I want to say a big thank you to Bill and Julia McBride. Uh, Bill and Julia own Matfield Station. They work with us to hold rooms for the artists, schedule the residencies, reschedule the residencies. <laughs> Um, and they're always kind and generous throughout all of it. Um, timber arches in the Prairie Art Path are also part of that Matfield Station property, and that's where we're gonna have the bonfire later tonight. Um, thank you. Bill's here, Julia's out of town, Bill and Lake are here. <laughs> yeah, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I also want to give a huge thank you to the Hams. Derek and Catherine Ham have been my ride or dies throughout this uh, entire process of the Tallgrass residency from the very first year. Uh, they serve as on-site residency managers and are basically my first line of defense for artist questions once they arrive on site. Um, Derek is also responsible for our branding and graphic design and works with the artists to install the group exhibition in this space. So basically, if it looks good, you can thank the hams. They're back in the corner. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> so I will, in a few minutes, introduce the artists that are going to speak this afternoon. But first, I want to invite uh, Matt up on stage, Matt and Tia. Uh, own and manage this space They're with the School for Rural Culture and Creativity. So Matt's going to talk about what they're up to, and it's, it's good stuff. Matt? Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Matt Regeer, and my wife, T, and I are co-founders co of this space, what we're calling the School for Rural Culture and Creativity, um, which is about three and a half years old. And this is uh, the third time sort of the fourth year that we've hosted this event. And uh, uh, Kelly and I were talking, I, I think we think that it's getting marginally better at least each, each year. So um, uh, that's mainly because we set the bar so extraordinarily low the first year. Um, <laughs> this space where you're all sitting was actually closed off with hazard tape. Um, people had to sign waivers before entering the building. That's actually not true, but, but it is true that this was closed off, that the walls were growing with thick with mildew and lichen and birds flying around. The windows were literally falling out of the building because the frames were rotted. And uh, 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 so we've, we've come a little ways since then, I like to think. Um, and uh, uh, um, this, oh, this also is actually the first year that we'll, we're hosting this event with a working bathroom. So that's been kind of a a long journey. It's uh, still not, yeah, yeah. Um, it's still not the, uh, we haven't got the hot tub installed yet, but it's, it's coming along. And actually that, uh, that flushing bathroom um, is really just uh, the last couple weeks. So we had, we had to install an all new septic system, septic and lateral system, which is how we do plumbing out in rural America here. So, um, um, yeah, we had a, a, lo a local guy here that does local dirt moving and can do a lot of that work here for us. And so a lot of, a lot of how we've got here has been sort of come from lots of small generosities, in some cases from unexpected sources, like someone came and did some work and then we asked them, well, why didn't we get an invoice? And just like, well, maybe you're not going to get an invoice. It's like, was like, is that, are you saying that we, you lost the invoice? Or like, no, this is just a Chase County way of being really generous and just pretending like it didn't happen. So uh, in, some, in some cases, um, you know, like with this local work with the septic, um, it's just not giving away the work, but it's 
often so much cheaper than it would be to get someone to come out here that it really makes things possible that we simply wouldn't have the funds to do without it. So, um, so yeah, we've basically persisted on small gifts, um, uh, volunteer help, a certain amount of luck along the way. And I, I want to say, I, I was having a conversation with our friend and neighbor who was doing this septic work and this dirt work, and he was telling me that uh, he went to school here, this elementary school, in some of the last days that this school was still operational. And when he came here in, in kindergarten and broke his arm on the monkey, monkey bars, he had eight kids in his class. And when he graduated from elementary school, shortly before the school would close, he had three. He went to school in Cottonwood Falls at that point and had 72 kids in his class, so quite a transition for him. Uh, but even then, by the time he graduated from high school, his class was down to just over 40. Matt Field had something called a booster station a few miles out of town that employed a lot of people at that time. Uh, the school, of course, which closed in uh, basically the late 70s. There was a lumber yard and hardware store at that time, a post office, service station, multiple restaurants, not to mention the various farms and ranches which employed a handful, at least, of cowboys or farmhands. All of those jobs have gone with the consolidation often of farms and ranches, sometimes into large out-of-state landowners. For more than half a century, basically, we have in rural communities like this one seen all kinds of resources being siphoning out of these communities, uh, whether it be people, businesses, traditional knowledge, young people, economic resources, and also cultural resources. Having a conversation with Kelly and Derek a few months ago talking about rural development in small towns, which is the kind of conversations we have out here, and talking about other models, other towns that are doing it wrong, you know. No, but about sometimes it looks, it seems like, well, you know, how do you, how do you rejuvenate a, a small town? And sometimes it looks like the, the easiest solution is a little bit of capital here, uh, maybe a coffee shop or a brewery here, um, a little bit of rural tourism in a way, uh, you know, or, you know, come visit a real life ghost town. It's, uh, <laughs> and all those things can be good. We're certainly not above taking urban people's money, but I do think that um, every rural community uh, whether it be looking further back, an indigenous one or a European one, was founded based on agriculture. And rural communities can't really exist without that basis of an agricultural existence. For, rural, for European communities, after agriculture, uh, those cultural resources are filled out with schools churches, and neighborly working relationships. Those things, I think, are harder to replace uh, with a coffee shop or a brewery or even art, for that matter. I don't really know how we replace some of those vacancies or if it can be done, but it's that kind of question that really motivates this project here at the school. Can we find ways to reintroduce agricultural rhythms into our communities? Can we save the few family farms that we have left? Can we acknowledge and understand our dependency on the land and its health? Can we build community relationships that aren't predetermined by political slogans? Can we, in the words of Wendell Berry, find the 
possibility of a neighborly, kind, and conserving economy. With those questions in the air, um, I do want to invite you to help us um, and support this project if you can. We currently do have a number of outstanding bills, including finishing up our uh, plumbing arrangement here, an insurance premium coming up. We're getting a new flat roof on this structure here, thanks um, in part to insurance, which Tia just got us insurance a few months before a windstorm came through here. Um, so that's a fair bit of luck, as I was referencing earlier. But there's deductibles to cover there, and we have had a couple of generous people come forward to help us with that. Um, and then finally, we would really love to be able to heat this space. If we could, and we're looking at possibly an exterior wood-burning furnace, which could use basically free local renewable wood that we tend to have a lot of laying around that we could heat this space and thereby really expand what we can do here by hosting open hours, doing events in the colder, colder months, um, and opening it up to all of you as visitors and also being more available to our community. Um, but it's hard to do that when it's 45 degrees in here or whatever. Um, and also keeping, keeping pipes from freezing is a good thing too. So if you are able, interested, uh, please consider making a donation. We do have a donation jar out here. Um, the school is a 501c3 nonprofit and you can also donate on the website schoolforruralculture.org and you can donate there, um, get on our email list and see if you can uh, contribute that way. Or, um, and then again, at the meal will be a, a fundraiser as well. Um, with that, I, don't want, I wanted to just thank you all for being here for, and to the residents for sharing your work and your lives with us. And um, to Kelly for starting this, and this residency has been really a great source of enrichment for our community and for lasting relationships. And so, thanks for that. I promised our speakers that I would model how to use this clicker, and then I totally forgot about it, so. I'll do that right now. <laughs> Isn't that a nice slide? <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing, sharing a bit about what you're up to here. Uh, Matt and Tia have been really wonderful to work with um, for this, this event this weekend and, and everything they do. They're wonderful neighbors and collaborators. Um, also, Matt was speaking about living more with more attunement to agricultural rhythms and to that end uh, we will be enjoying a harvest <laughs> of foods uh, later this evening so Matt and Tia kind of organized um, volunteers and producers from the local community and they will be putting together the meal for tonight that will be served around 6 30 so stick around for that so I'm gonna introduce our 2022 Artists in Residence. We had seven artists joining us this year and we have six of those artists with us here today. Um, each one will be coming on stage to speak a little bit about their practice and their time with the residency here. Um, each, each speaker has 10 minutes. Um, Here's the clicker, y'all. We have name slides between each presentation, so once you're done with your slides, if you just advance to the next slide, I think we can flow through this pretty, pretty easily. We will take a couple of breaks this afternoon, and uh, if we didn't point it out earlier, housekeeping procedures, there are restrooms outside the doors over here, too. So we're gonna take a couple of breaks throughout the afternoon. After we hear from our artists in residence, I will come back and introduce our featured guest speaker later this afternoon. Very excited about that. Please stick around. Um, so I think I'm going to invite on stage R.N. Yoon. 
Aaron, come on up. Please join me in welcoming Aaron to the stage. So glad to be here with you today. I think I'm a little shorter than Matt and Kelly. Okay, I think it's, uh, is it here? Yeah. Okay. So I arrived in this country when I was five and my brother was seven, the same ages of my children during this residency. The first place we visited was Disneyland, so I thought we had hit the jackpot. America was even better than I'd expected. Soon after, we settled in Warrensburg, Missouri, and then a new reality sank in. I was transported from the cityscape of Seoul to the American Midwest. I have clear memories of walking through the vast prairie and the mazes of cornfields as a child. This is a studio photo that my mom had taken in preparation to come to the US for the passport and visa applications. In Korea, they used to photograph children with their mothers. My dad was going to graduate school at what was then Central Missouri State University, and we had come to visit. We didn't know that we were never going back to Korea. He didn't want us to leave. When I took this photo, it was drizzling. A tiny, fortuitous raindrop fell right under my eye. I didn't realize this until I was editing that this had happened. I asked my child self, why are you crying? In photography, there are so many variables. What kind of light will there be today? What, what accidents and interventions will occur as I make work? A drop of rain, a glare of light, through a collaborative process with my children, we immerse ourselves in the natural landscape and explore not only our relationships to our surrounding, but also to each other and to my memories and to their histories. Here, the future holds up the past. I noticed the kids interacting with nature, playing together and seeing how they create their own worlds and make their own memories. It is when I give in to seeing their world through their eyes that I find it easiest to parent. And then sometimes their magic seeps into my world when I let go of trying to be in control. I project my past onto them, but I know parts of them remember it too. As I look to the past, I see into wow. the future. One day as we were walking, Mila asked me, Mom, are we in a dream? Are we? I wanted to share this time of creative exploration with my children. They made art on paper, on each other, and sometimes onto the landscape. Art became more accessible to them when they were able to touch and interact with it, thanks to Bill's sculptures. It wasn't just a precious thing to look at, but something to experience and feel. As a child, I sometimes had the feeling that I didn't quite belong. I was constantly made self-aware of my physical differences by others. My brother and I were the only Asian kids at our school. Comments like, oh my God, she looks just like a China doll were directed at my mom, who would respond with a nod and an uncertain smile. My mom is a tailor, so fabrics and textiles are meaningful to her, to us. I used to help her, her hang clothes in the dry cleaning store, and with each garment, you feel a sense of the person who wears it. I include Korean fabrics into my picture so that our histories are incorporated into the memories of this landscape. I think I'm one. Okay. I remember wearing humbooks as a child in Missouri, but only in closed spaces, maybe at the International Festival at my dad's school, or the Korean church on Lunar New Year's, or Chuseok, the Korean Harvest Festival. My grandmother gave this blanket to my mom on her wedding day. She gave it to me and now it belongs to my daughter. What does this land represent? I think about the house I'm in during the residency, a casita built for Mexican rail workers a century ago, one of the last ones to survive. There are three units in the bunkhouse. From the drawing in the room, it looks like there could have been up to eight or 10 at one point. I had packed this Mexican dress that was gifted to Mila without the knowing the history of the bunkhouse. I feel like it's an homage to the workers. The kids are obsessed with this wild garlic, brought here possibly by Mexican laborers. A part of their history continues to grow and nourish. 
During my residency, I talked with my friend Haruka. She was doing a project called Kampu about the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. She sh shows me a photo of a jail cell in the camp where someone had scratched into the wall, show me the way to go home. It is a heartbreaking image. I think about what it means to be taken away from your home and forced on a land that tries to devour you. I think about the Chinese rail workers who built the transcontinental railway, how they are omitted in this 1869 photo commemorating the completion of the railroad. Everyone is celebrating opening champagne as the final golden spike is hammered into the track. How easily are our experiences as immigrants erased from American history? This 2014 photo by Corky Lee of the descendants of those Chinese laborers was taken 145 years after that original photo was made. We can bring back some of our histories in commemorating the forgotten, lost, and an erased remembering. I experiment with different photographic te techniques during the residency. I use slow shutter speeds to illustrate the photographic collapse of time and space. I use flash to isolate moments and memories. The more trains I watch pass behind the casitas, the more details I notice. I realize the ones carrying oil move slower than the ones carrying coal. My children recognize the logos on the trains moving consumer goods across the US after just a few clicks on someone's phone or computer. There's a whole system of labor and movement that I don't always consider. Through this work, I re-examine re my connection to this land, reconsidering overlooked histories as I tap into my own forgotten memories, conjuring the past, making new memories, all while exploring my connection to the natural landscape, to my children, and to our past and future selves. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, I'm Corey. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself, a little bit about my artwork, um, what kind of drew me to the residency, um, and kind of about the, the work that I did while I was out here and the work that I've done since then. Um, so I was fortunate enough to have three different opportunities out here in Kansas. So I spent my whole summer here, and yeah, I love Kansas, it's great. Can't wait to come back. Um, so I'm originally from a small um, agronomy just outside of Silicon Valley. So I'm interested, um, I guess kind of like the baggage or the gaze that I bring with me in my artwork is this intersection of technology and rural communities. So it's kind of where my heart lies. Um, so who here has heard of um, JBS? I'm originally, well right now I'm staying in um, a town called Greeley and it's home to JBS which is the largest uh, cattle processing um, plant in our country. Um, so it's hard not to think about cows um, working out there. Um, so a lot of my research is looking at the cattle industry and um, a lot of that kind of brought me to Kansas and looking at the Flint Hills and kind of researching um, some similar communities out there. One of the ranches I came across was a Mush Rush Ranch um, up here that works with the uh, um, prairie Reserve. And if you notice something that's interesting about these cows is they have these satellite collars on their neck. And what's interesting about that is that it allows them to track and guide them in a fenceless system. Um, and they are able to work a lot with um, the timing of their feed timing and work with the natural environment, which is inspiring, is um, kind of using you know, cattle as this um, relationship to our land, to our people, and just kind of um, more, I guess, um, renewable, um, yeah, cattle practices. Prior to the pandemic, um, I kind of stepped across this, um, looking at, I guess, you know, tech in cattle or tech in um, agriculture. Um, I found this rumor of Russian farmers using VR goggles on cows to aid in like milk production um, and also just cattle rearing in general. And I was chasing this rumor and it just seemed kind of hokey at first, but then um, more examples of uh, farmers using VR goggles um, to 
you know, I guess, help with like cattle production and milk productions and such things. Um, and I think, you know, being, I think at this time, it was during like the, the peak of the lockdown, the pandemic, and more of our lives kind of being forced um, in this digital realm and kind of making these relationships our own, like, I guess it's a sense of like virtual and real. And um, I questioned too, what are these cows actually seeing on these VR goggles? Because I couldn't really find anything. So I created my own um, VR um, cow simulator that I showcased up here at the, the preserve during my residency that you could live your experience as a cow. So this is like the brown grass that was like, that I originally shot it from being up in Colorado. But during my residency, I changed it to green so it looked a lot more like your beautiful green um, prairie grasses out here. Um, but you can kind of see this example of like, you kind of walk around and kind of live, you know, experience life as a cow. Um, and how did that end up with uh, me creating a, a video game? And I think that for my style of work, um, I'm a research-based artist, so I think I came out here wanting to search, you know, research more of the cattle industry, but I fell in love with um, just the, the town of Matfield Green and just the, the communities out here in Kansas. So I went up to um, a lot of the museums um, up in Cottonwood Falls and the surrounding areas in Chase County, and just kind of researching, you know, um, a little more about the town that I was in and kind of the history of um, the area and kind of looking at, you know, I think everybody that stayed at the station had the, the typical um, train shot. So I wanted to kind of, um, yeah, post my own. But I was interested in like, you know, the train station and how it kind of brought um, the, the town of Batfield Green and kind of the history of that as well, that, you know, brought um, the town into existence a lot of ways and kind of relating that back to the cattle industry. Um, and then kind of looking at how it went from, you know, the apex of its population, and as soon as we started getting, you know, trucks and um, vehicles and kind of making a lot of these train systems almost obsolete in some ways, um, we saw the population kind of decline near, I think, like the 90s. So I kind of got interested, like, what did Matfield Green look like in the 90s? And I don't know what it did, so um, if you have lived here and could help me with that information, I would love to hear about it. Um, also, working with um, Derek Cam, I was um, intrigued by seeing his old um, Super Nintendo back in the, um, the room back there, and I just got this idea of, like, you know, I guess 90s nostalgia. Um, this also was mixed with um, a lot of the research and museums um, information was on the, the schools in Matfield Green. Um, and not so much this building in particular, I think it was the high school that was most existed, but I just thought, you know, the history of the school, um, or just kind of like looking at a town's history through the lens of the school was kind of just an interesting um, thing as far as like having resources or just a documentation of what a, a town could be. And so the game, it's a growing thing, um, but right now it um, takes place within the school, and that's kind of the area that I focused on. Not only because that's where you know we're you know our community is showcased right now, uh, but also just kind of like the vast amount of resources and research that I found was kind of in that that realm. Yeah. So if you get a chance and you haven't, take a look at the game, play it, give me some feedback, let me know what I did wrong or some things that you enjoyed or if you have any ideas that inspire it, um, I'd love to hear about it. And um, yeah, thank you. so much. Um, I think it's a real pleasure to be here and, and so nice to see so many people in this space. I mean, the last time I was in this space, I was roller skating in it with like three other children. So this is like a, a bit of a uh, shift. Um, I, uh, you know, expected... Oh, sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay.
like this. Okay. Um, I uh, expected to come here and have a really wonderful experience and you know, communing with the landscape here, and that did happen, as I think it did for probably everybody that came here, but I didn't expect <clears throat> such a, you know, it, the residency is a little monastic in a certain way. I didn't expect, which is unusual for a lot of artist residencies, if you're not familiar, usually there's kind of a summer camp vibe, um, for better or for worse. And so this one attracted me more than that, and I was really pleasantly surprised um, and, and touched that everybody here was so kind and inviting and hospitable to me while I was here, and I think that's an experience that, that uh, everybody felt um, that was able to do this this summer. So it's a pleasure to be invited back, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you again. I left my dad, who was here as well, I left him out way west of town, and then I kind of lost him. And then I was asking people in town, it was like, I actually knew the names of the people that I encountered in town. It's like, hey, Mike, have you seen my dad? You know, so <laughs> felt, felt good. Um, I was here, uh, there was a week or two in July that was like average 97 to 104 degrees. Um, and that's when I was here. Uh, and it was brutal, um, but also really, really amazing. So I'm going to run through, I'm kind of, I was here as a, in a sort of like functionalist way, and I'm gonna have a functionalist kind of presentation about the stuff that I made while I was here. Um, I'm gonna run through really quick just some of my like background as an artist and what kinds of work I make when I'm not here. Uh, similarly to Greeley, you know, I, I spent, uh, in my graduate school days, I did a lot of imagery working from feedlots out in western Kansas. Um, these both are from that time, and I'm really interested in the kind of uh, challenges that agricultural agriculture and industrial agriculture um, has with the lands, the natural environment and the tension between the two. Uh, I also do, have done work focusing on like suburban sprawl. Um, this is a, a six by six foot painting, so relatively close to life size. There was a farm north of my uh, town that I live in in Iowa where the children of uh, the grand, you know, grandchildren or whatever broke a land trust um, and had all of this farmland that was supposed to be preserved um, developed into a beautiful housing development. So I did some work kind of documenting the transformation of the landscape during that time. This painting's like uh, five by 20 maybe. Um, otherwise, I also sort of starting in the pandemic, I started working a lot more uh, intimately, a lot smaller, as partially as a way to hang out with one of my buddies who paints. Um, so we were working outside a lot, which was something that I always felt uber squeamish about, um, setting up an easel outside. Um, but I've gotten over it, I think, a little bit anyway. So it's been a really great way for me to capture like these little moments in the place that I live, or even I have a young daughter, I sort of set up and paint the still lives that she leaves so thoughtfully around the house for me. So, uh, so it's become actually a really primary part of my practice, and I was excited to sort of work with that level of immediacy while I was here. Um, I also, for my day job, quote unquote, I do murals, and so I try as much as I can to kind of work with imagery um, and topics that uh, if you can find the right person to help fund that or whatever, um, that feel right to me. Oops. Sorry. This is the last one that I just did. It's up in Rockford, Illinois. It's a view of the watershed of the Pecatonica River. So, um, I, the first day that I was here was like 93, so that was going to be the coolest day that I was here. So I decided that I would take this long hike through the preserve north of town. And um, I went for about, it was supposed to be 12, and I took two wrong turns, ended up like 15 miles. Um, there was a brief moment of shade, uh, which, was, which was great. Uh, it's, you know, Iowa is like the most transformed state in terms of the least amount of natural environment remaining. So for somebody particularly from Iowa, where there's like 0.01% of prairie remain, remnants, to be able to hike all day long uh, and only see prairie is a really, really rare and special experience. So that was really great. Um, I've been in this spot once or twice on road trips out west, and I have this feeling when I'm here of like my body entering a kind of like negative pressure chamber, and that like the sense of space here and the kind of oceanic way of the prairie uh, feels really good to me, feels really right to me. Um, so I was excited to come here and spend a little bit more a little bit more time. Um, 
on that hike, this was like one of the first things that I saw and it kind of caught my attention and I'm gonna cycle back to that at the end of my presentation. Um, everything felt really actually quite bleak. It was like very green and very same. And like I was like really wanting to love this place and I was like, oh boy, it's like, I got to like shift my focus. And uh, I expected based on when I was here that there was gonna be a lot of bloom. And I, I think that my image of that bloom was not actually it was out of touch with what it really was like here, which is small and scattered and a little bit of a tough life for these plants. But once you start looking, you know, there were flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers everywhere, lots and lots of bloom, which was really exciting to see. Also, uh, even in this like piece of untouched prairie that we're also proud of, a piece of like commodity row crop as well. Um, and then this tree, which is just, if you, if you know it, you know it, a really beautiful special tree over up at the preserve. So I wasn't sure um, how I wanted to spend my time here, but if there's any like sentiment for what a residency is, I think you're maybe not supposed to really know. Uh, and so I just started making things and, and thought I'll see what happens. So I was doing a lot of um, painting and drawing on site and sort of searching for moments of like form within the landscape that attracted me. Um, and they felt sort of like interesting little vignettes or little postcards for me but they didn't feel particularly like what I was looking for. Um, I started painting more like expansive views. This is out west of town, um, uh, right where I left my dad. And, and um, those, I sort of felt like, okay, I know that I can do these paintings. This is sort of like in my wheelhouse of painting. Um, and it felt like it was in touch with the landscape and the open spaces that I could sort of work with capturing the color and the light. Um, and so that was great, you know, it's great. And if you like to work outside, you like to paint outside, like it doesn't get any better than this. This is like really beautiful, beautiful um, place to paint, which was really exciting. Um, here's that little painting of that tree, uh, cottonwood tree. And I did some gouache studies too, which were great because like pretty much as soon as you made the mark, it was dry. I was doing these like over the, over the lunch hour, which was uh, smart. Very smart, so. Um, most of the time in that midday though, I brought all the materials to do cyanotypes. If any of you aren't familiar with what that is, it's kind of a Victorian era technology of like very uh, primitive photography. So you rub a chemical on this paper, you expose it to light wherever you have stuff over the paper. You know, you might have called them sun prints as a kid. Um, and so I, I'm a real professional, and I did this with like a mop and a board and a piece of glass that Derek helped me find because I forgot to bring all my supplies for this. Um, but it worked. You know, I, I was taking this hottest part of the day and running these, cyan running these cyanotypes just with the plants sort of in location. So not cutting anything, just kind of exposing inside. I was interested in density and form and um, movement um, as I was making these. Also, there are people who do cyanotypes that like are really, really good at it. I thought, I've always wanted to do this and I'll use my time here to sort of explore that. So I, for me, it's sort of like the plants do the work for you um, and I don't claim to be any kind of expert, um, but some of them turn, turned out nicely to me. Um, <clears throat> I also printed up postcards. It's like rare that I have time to sit down and write letters to people and it was wonderful while I was here. I sort of wrote to family and friends and especially teachers over the years who had helped like cultivate in me an appreciation of the prairie and of the landscape. And so um, it was nice. I think I wrote about 40 postcards, which I dropped in a mailbox here. And then I wasn't sure like, is this mailbox even active anymore? But <laughs> everybody got them eventually. So um, starting next week, actually, um, just as an outgrowth of this time, I've been doing some collage work with the cyanotypes that didn't turn out so well. And in my hometown, I'm gonna be doing two, uh, on both sides of this new building, two 170 foot murals that feature the um, impressions that I took while I was here. So I'm excited to bring a little bit of, of uh, the tall grass prairie back to Iowa, if, even if this is the best we can do, so. Um, so, let me cycle here. Uh, after being here for most of the week, I started to feel like, um, a little bit like I was clued in for what I was interested in. That first little impression from my first day was like in those, in windmill pasture or whatever, where all the bison 
lay down and roll over and stuff. And so there's all these marks left in the grass um, that really caught my attention. And uh, so I started going, I brought all my stuff out and started documenting them out there. And, you know, I think that prairie is this sort of beautiful, beautiful anarchy, you know, like all these plants that come together and make this really special thing. And it is that sort of anarchic sameness that makes it resilient as a, as a, as a landscape. It also made it, for me, unexpectedly boring to, to paint and draw. And so it, these moments really stood out to me because they felt like within that sort of oceanic kind of sameness that there were these moments of gesture and movement and activity um, that were left on the landscape. And so I felt like I think that there is, there is something here. Um, there are also all these wallows out there. And I think that there's something there, but maybe somebody else can figure out what to do with those. Um, and so I went out and started to draw them. I schlepped all my gear out there and, um, and sorry, I'm losing my track of my notes here, um, and started drawing. You know, I'm really interested in making drawings that felt as sort of um, fleeting and immediate and as full of energy as those uh, little moments in the grass were. These are just like additive and subtractive charcoal drawings, so pretty straight up stuff, the kind of things that I teach my students to do. Um, and these are what the drawings sort of turned out like. You know, I don't really know um, what I'm going to do with these drawings ultimately, but they capture something for me, like an intimacy with this space that I had started to feel like after six days that I wasn't sure I was gonna get to. So I can see them being larger pieces and I could see them even being mu at mural scale. Um, and I can also see them just being uh, exactly as they are, which is like a record of my time spent here, like sitting in this prairie and spending the afternoon drawing surrounded by bison. And if, if that's all it is, then I think that that actually might be good enough for my, for my time here. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thomas, and thanks to our first group of, of speakers. Um, I just want to acknowledge, too, that it's, 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 it's very vulnerable, I think, to talk about work in progress. And so I, I, I thank all of our artists here who are sharing kind of th the immediacy of things that they've discovered and are working on. It's, it's really a gift to, that you're sharing with us, so thank you. Um, we are going to take a short break. Oh, this is the this is the roller skate day that Thomas was talking about. I, I had to include that somewhere. Uh, we'll come back at uh, four fifteen. So short break. Move around. Stretch your legs. Thanks. All right, hello, hello, welcome back everyone. We're gonna get started with the second round of artist talks from our 2022 residents. We're gonna save this slide for later because Bill McBride has exited the building, but we're gonna hear more later about Matfield Green Works, which organized the, the local open studios uh, earlier this morning. So we'll come back to that. Um, but next up, Jeremiah Rees, please come to the stage. <laughs> So without strong local journalism to tell a community story, the fabric of a place becomes frayed. I've been photographing these small town newspaper offices across the state of Kansas. And before I go too far into that work, I do want to just echo the thanks to this community, particularly those with the Tallgrass uh, Artist Residency Program. Uh, and also I want to extend a deep debt of gratitude to the Reeses um, who've allowed me to sort of extend my residency in an unofficial way and continue the body of work that I have begun here and um, hopefully we'll be completing this project very soon. So thank you so much uh, for that. So I began photographing these small town newspaper offices in the run up to the 2020 presidential election. And I was seeking ways 
to visualize democracy. What does democracy look like? What does that look like on the streets of rural America? And I found myself in a newspaper office as part of a much larger project that I was working on in these battleground states across the country. I found that the subject matter was so rich that it demanded deeper consideration. And I expanded the project working nationally. But then I wanted to narrow the focus and find that spot where I could come in and be able to tell a story more deeply, also in a way more broadly, but in a way that could speak to these larger concerns. So I've been photographing these newspaper offices all across Kansas. So the time that I was in residence, I was venturing off to the communities around, uh, uh, around Matfield Green, Emporia, Marion, Hillsborough, El Dorado, Newton, these places, making photographs in these newspaper offices. And sometimes what I would find, I would go up to these buildings, um, the Emporia Gazette, this grand two-story brick building, this wooden, these tall wooden doors, these bronze door handles with lions carved into them, this grand building. And the door was closed, the door was locked. And these papers had vacated these historic structures where they had, they had been. And the country has lost over a quarter of our newspapers in the last 10 years. And just as I have been working here in Kansas, I've been going to community to community, photographing these newspaper offices, both those that are in operation, as well as those that have closed down. Often so recently that the newspaper sign still hangs in front of the building, and often the equipment to publish that paper is still inside. Um, it's a project that I don't think I could have waited even another year to do. The project is so much of this particular moment. But it's not just a look at this industry. It's not just a look at Kansas. It's really asking questions about our larger democracy, asking questions about our communities, what it takes for us to be a community, and what happens when those relationships become frayed. We've been driven in such a polarized community by national voices that are dividing us. And we're losing the channels that bring us together. We're losing places like the community's newspapers that allow us to be seen, to give a voice, for our communities to be reflected in. So, I grew up in Great Bend, Kansas, and uh, it's kind of the geographic center of the state. And um, I have been working on this project all across the state. There's a map sitting on the table in front of the photographs. There's little gold dots in communities from the west to the east, north to south. And I'm still continuing. So, uh, ultimately, I... Gosh, I haven't even started the slides yet. Come on, somebody help me out here. Somebody help me out. So uh, these slides, um, which are going to be repeated on the laptop, and you'll see examples on the wall. So this is just, this is just going to go. That's my hometown newspaper of Great Bend, Kansas. Ultimately, I'm going to have uh, 50 of these facades, 50 to kind of be a representation of, of, of the country. Um, but th within that grid, there will be spots that are missing, spots where papers might have been. This is the Daily Globe in Dodge City, also just had moved out of their office this year. Uh, this tape is kind of going around the front door. Um, and these, I guess you might call them ghost offices, the Emporia Gazette. Um, the Beloit Call, these newspapers will be on a large grid on an opposing wall. And so this is just one element of, 
uh, this project that had tentatively been called the Fourth Estate. Um, that's what it was as a national project. I think it's probably going to eventually assume a title for this work that will stand alone as a single body of work here in Kansas. Um, you know, when I go inside of these spaces and talk to the people, the publishers, the owners, the editors, the writers, and I hear of the stories they have to tell, and I see the spaces that they work in. And these pictures are really a way to honor them, a way to honor the newspaper industry, uh, to celebrate the civic function of the newspapers. I have some prints on the wall, so this right here is uh, William Allen White, a portrait that still hangs at the entrance of the Gazette, even though the paper uh, is, is no longer in that particular space. Um, enlargers, you know, there's a particular interest in photography. I don't, the first photograph that I made in a newspaper office <laughs> was of a dark room in a newspaper office. And I thought that that would be the crux of the work. And of course, it just got broader and broader and broader. And both in what the photographs meant for me as an artist working, uh, but also the way that I felt they resonated the concerns that I had as just a citizen of, of this country. Um, this image right here happened to be on Memorial Day. Um, so I've been a resident of this place, <laughs> but I've been traveling all over. And I'm so grateful that this residency gave me the time to really be in one place, to reflect on what I wanted to do it gave me the opportunity to imagine the scope of what this work could be. It gave me a chance to have long conversations with the people that are here and to um, interview them, and this will become a part of the project in, in, in some fashion. Now, ultimately, my goal has been to photograph all the newspaper offices still in Kansas, and uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to reach that, but I am going to try, and I've probably photographed uh, uh, about 60 offices would be my guess at this point, and I'm gonna continue through uh, the next month. Um, why Kansas? So, um, another question that I've been asked as I'm doing this. Well, Kansas is my home state. Um, I mentioned I started doing this across the country. Well, I needed a place to anchor the work. I needed a place to, to, uh, to really uh, uh, be in one place and to be able to do that as comprehensively as possible. Kansas also has this incredibly rich history of local journalism. Uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, that legacy is a tribute to William Allen White. Um, his presence is still, I find, really deeply felt. Some of his kin still work at and own newspapers in Kansas. People that worked under him still operate newspapers in Kansas that were seeds from William Allen White, what, what, what he gave. So that becomes a reason. Kansas, of course, is an incredibly rural state. And all of these communities, approximately every 20 to 35 miles apart, had a newspaper. And so, um, just for the work, it was a rich place to investigate. Um, the dark room, the former dark room of the Emporia Gazette. Um, the Tiller and Toiler in Larned, Kansas, the closest paper to my mom's house. <laughs> um, after I posted uh, this particular image, somebody had sent me 
A photograph from the Emporia Gazette from almost the same vantage point made, you know, I don't know, a few years before, the newsroom full of people. You could just see desk after desk with people working. And you'll see that if you look at the slideshow that I have on my laptop, I have a comparison slide. When I was in this space, there was a calendar on the wall of August 2022, the month that I was in there, the time that I was physically working in that space, that calendar still hung on the wall. So it felt so urgent. It felt so of this particular moment. These community newspapers quite literally hold the history of the communities. They're archives. What happens to these places when these newspapers close? What happens to that history? Where does it go? I was in the Newton, Kansas. I was just telling the story. I was in the Newton, Kansas. And I walked in. It happened to be the 150th anniversary the day that I walked in. They'd made two strawberry cakes and a chocolate. 150 candles on the cake. Nobody, the editor had called the local television news, talked to some other uh, news reporters to see if they'd be interested in telling that story. The 150th anniversary. Nobody had returned the calls, nobody had returned the emails. But I walk in, <laughs> and here I am, and I'm interested in the things that he's interested in. I care about the things that he cares about, and I spend the day in there talking with him, making photographs, and they had just moved out of their space, so I had access to that. He was able to call the building owner, and there were the archives on the top floor just sitting. The historical society wasn't going to take them. The libraries weren't going to take them. What happens to this history when these papers disappear? What happens to our collective history? That was uh, the Newton Kansan. A funky little still life that just seemed to be there for me. Some of these papers have merged. Uh, uh, this was uh, the Marion County record, I believe, uh, with the Hillsborough paper and also the Peabody newspaper. And so, this is Larry. Worked his, uh, worked his career in the newspaper industry for the uh, Norton Telegram. He was describing to me how all of this equipment worked, the linotype machine that he would feed lead into uh, to create the type. That lead sort of splashed against the back of the wall. You can see that in the photograph. So I'm interested in these individuals as well. The photographs that are on the wall, they're, they're sample prints. They're um, you know, for today's event. You know, ultimately these will be much larger, probably 40 by 50 inch photographs um, where you can really just see every detail, where you can be immersed into those physical spaces. But also, you know, they're just, they're such beautiful spaces. Um, you know, this is the newspaper in Alma, Kansas, very close to where I'm staying. This is very odd because this is the Newton Kansan. I can't help but think of this like a tombstone, like a memorial stone. The editor, I was taking this photograph and he was taking a picture of me taking this photograph. And it was on the front page of their newspaper like shortly after their 150th anniversary. And, I, and just the poetry of that was too much. Um, Dodge City Globe, another grand building, went in. Paper, paper had been there earlier this year, had just, just moved into another office, vacated building, you know, three-story building. Two flags remained in a glass case in the back, uh, a couple other remnants of their uh, uh, ephemera, but just the reflection of that empty space behind. So, thank you.
Hello. Um, just want to give a, such a thank you for, you know, to see a room full of people in a town this small, and it's just been such a welcoming, wonderful experience to be a part of this residency, so I really appreciate it. I'm Leslie Von Holten. I have always been a writer. Um, I, so to talk to a room full of visual artists who have these really great slides is a little bit intimidating, but I will do my best here. Uh, my talk is going to be pretty free-ranging, um, and so probably a little messy, and I'll explain a little bit of why. So here's the horse that um, it was across the highway from where I was staying at Matfield Station. Uh, I was just absolutely mesmerized. I don't know if the owner of this horse is in the room or not. Um, but she would just glow at night, and so I was just absolutely captivated. Uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020, it shook me in an interesting way, um, ultimately for myself personally, in a good way. I um, have, like I said, always been a writer, and I've been a very tight, what I would call a tight writer. I would really belabor my sentences. My, um, one of my writing partners uh, said to me one time, she said, you know, your sentences kind of make me tired. <laughs> like, <laughs> you need to loosen up. You need to get a little messy. So that is what I've been trying to embrace, and that's what I'm embracing here on stage in front of you is sort of being messy about it, um, not really having a plan here. So... Uh, like I said, the pandemic kind of shook me a little bit. I Fortunately, I changed jobs. I'll be honest, I started some therapy, and I highly recommend this to folks who are creatives. The purpose of my therapy was to talk about my relationship to my writing, and it was, you know, so expansive and wonderful, and um, so... I realized I needed to change my relationship to my writing. I had always been focused on the end product. I have been in love with Prairie and with Kansas my whole life. And my writing wanted to sh like pull you through to see the way, see my love, make an argument, make you see it the way I see it. Um, and then I realized the practice needs to be what I am working through, not the final project. Uh, another great thing about the pandemic is that a lot of um, opportunities started becoming available on Zoom. So I was able, fortunately, to get into a work group with a group of writers in England that I had long admired, the Dark Mountain Project. Um, they are, they started out as a group of radicals. They, like me, are kind of mellowing in their age a little bit. Um, but I was really fortunate to be a part of this group of 15 people who were international. And um, Charlotte Ducan is a performance artist and a writer in England. She was part of the Dark Mountain Project. They have a manifesto that's online that I really recommend that you read. And one day, we were all talking on Zoom, and she said, your practice is your praise song. And that just really shook me. Um, so I want my practice to be my praise song to the prairie. And um, these are so, also some other techniques that Charlotte and Doogie um, kind of got me into. And that is like, putting yourself on the prairie, physically, in your body. Um, and so here I am in a bison wallow, and this is actually, this is not the Flint Hills, this is Clark County, Kansas, um, in the Big Basin Nature Preserve down by the Oklahoma border. And if you love the tall grass prairie, I highly recommend that you go check out Clark County too, because it's just stunningly beautiful. Let's see what's next. All right. Um, I also have a, a, my degree, my bachelor's degree is in art history, and it really informs 
so much uh, still of what I do. I love art history. Uh, my writing started as an art critic, um, and some of that tightness is probably, you know, has, is uh, related to, you know, back in that day it was newspapers, and so I had, you know, just a certain number of column inches that I could write about the art. This is Anna Mandia Ada. Um, when I started lying on the dirt and getting into the grass for my practice, I really kept thinking about her work. And I haven't really connected it at all to Prairie, even though she, was, she started doing a lot of this work in Iowa. But she just, there we go. This is more of her work. Um, a lot of her work was about the you know, violence experienced on bodies and women's bodies, but really captivating work. So that's some stuff that goes through my head as I'm writing. The clicker doesn't like me, Kelly. Yeah, can you? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so the reason that I was in Big Basin in Clark County is because I am absolutely in love with Ronald Johnson, who was an avant-garde artist or avant-garde poet who grew up in Ashland near there. And I don't have the time to really geek out on the poetry that I would love to tell you all about, but he did write a poem about Big Basin, St. Jacob's Well, that is in Big Basin, and ascending up to the heavens and connecting with Henry James and going to Niagara Falls, and it's completely nuts. But um, surprisingly, lying there in a bison wallow, thinking about Ronald Johnson, opened that poem up for me. And so I have been so fortunate, and the New Territory Magazine is publishing it in December, which I'm really thrilled about. All right, next. Oh, it's a bad photo of, of St. Jacob's Well there in Clark County. And there's a bison who um, was there one time. Uh, in my, I don't want to repeat too much of what my talk was that I did during my residency, but uh, paying close attention and also during this period of change and transformation for me, I've had the really weird experience of running into snakes a lot. Um, so I was doing a um, full moon hike out at the preserve, Tallgrass Preserve, and I accidentally almost stepped on a rattlesnake. And so she and I kind of had our moment there under the moonlight, which I wrote about in my zine, which is free for everybody to pick up. Then when I was in Clark County just a few months later, I almost stepped on another rattlesnake, which is just the weirdest thing. Um, and then, so then I had a moment where I was standing on the cliff. I could not go into the basin. The rattlesnake was going on right here. I was leaving her alone, but she was continued to make a racket. And then I realized there was this lone bull who was down by St. Jacob's Well. And so I was not able to get down to the water like I had wanted to that day. All right, so I told you it's a mess. Um, I was thrilled when I um, was awarded um, this residency because I kept like, what does snakes mean? Like, why do I keep having these run-ins with snakes? And I'm thinking about snake skins and shedding our skin and changing our skin. And then, of course, if you don't know who this is, you are probably familiar with her photo. This is Maud Wagner. This photo is in the Library of Congress, um, and she is from this area. So I wrote about her in the zine a little bit, and it really started connecting the snake skins and changing and changing our skin. Maud is known um, as the first lady tattooer, and uh, she was married to Gus Wagner, who was a, the tattooed globetrotter. And they traveled the country doing um, circus acts, vaudeville, and tattooing people. So really great history here that is still um, 
still has room to learn more about Maud. She really kind of kept her cards close to her chest a little bit, so there's not a lot of um, documentation out there to trace her. All right, so this is a little dark, but then I got to thinking, okay, Maud's the first lady tattooer, but is she? And um, came across, this is another portrait that you are probably familiar with if you don't know Kakitsi. Uh, she is a Wichita woman. This is a painting by George Catlin. And um, she was in Oklahoma at the time, but of course, you know, the Wichita were also in Kansas, especially her ancestors would have been in Etsanoa along the Walnut River down by um, Ark City. But if you can tell, she's tattooed right there all across her chest, her lips, and her chin. And I discovered her when looking, just sort of searching for the history of women and tattoos and women tattooers and the Wichita women and Kiowa women um, are tattooing themselves. And I discovered this because there are young women, Kiowa women, who are doing this again to connect to Kakitsi. So, and again, we know so little about Maud, we know even less about Kakitsi and her story. So that's part of the work that I was writing about in my zine. All right, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's see if this works. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Dan. Um, I also just wanted to start off with gratitude to the Tallgrass Artist Residency for inviting me here. Um, this would be my first ever artist residency, and just feeling the support of my work has meant a lot to me um, personally. And thank you also to you who have come, because I feel like when we come together, a new energy is created. So I appreciate that. Um, so I'm a writer as well, and I'm also going to embrace the mess. And um, I write fiction, nonfiction, and uh, in the past I've written poetry. Um, and the reason that I wanted to come to Kansas is um, tied to my family history. I grew up in New Jersey, I'm from New Jersey, but my mother's side, who's Native American, is all based in Oklahoma. And I would often come to Oklahoma like in the summers and spend a lot of time out here. Um, but I have never been to Kansas and would find myself in my writing and my poetry, fiction, nonfiction, continually coming back to this region, especially connecting to my childhood memories. And what I found was that I could write about my family, but always from a very particular perspective and memory and wanting to branch out and have more understanding of the Prairie region firsthand is really what motivated me to come to Kansas. Um, so on one of my first days here, I went to the Prairie Reserve and um, just really fell in love with it and kind of echoing what Thomas said about the oceanic feeling, um, really felt that when I got out there of like, wanting to love the landscape, but also kind of confronting it and feeling the, um, the uniqueness of it, like the starkness, and you almost feel like you're on water, and that's something I never would have known if I did not come here myself. Um, and one poet who I was reading to help me kind of think through the landscape was Denise Lowe, and this quote really stuck with me. Um, the tall grass prairie stirs the imagination, not because it is empty, but because it is vast. And that distinction between emptiness and vastness really stuck with me. And um, there's something like sublime about the prairie, like it's hard to even comprehend. And I think we often think that with like mountains or the ocean, but to come to the prairie and see that for myself was uh, really impactful. Um, and one other thing I should caveat is that I have 
just kind of done my residency right now. So I'm still really processing all of it and seeing how this will build into my work and what types of uh, what type of writing I use to I draw out of this experience. But just a few snippets of uh, inspiration that I found while I was here. Um, in the bottom right is I went to Wichita because uh, so like one of the family stories that I encountered while coming here was that um, my grandmother and grandfather met in Wichita at the McConnell Air Force Base, which is kind of not really part of the family lore that we always talk about. It's always like, oh, Oklahoma, we go to Oklahoma. But to find out that they met in Wichita and actually my mom grew up in Wichita for the first three or four years of her life was really uh, interesting because again, it's not something she ever talks about. So I, um, I enjoyed going down to Wichita and seeing the keeper of the plains and driving around. Next. <laughs> um, so we, we can skip this slide. Yeah. Um, so before I came here, one thing that I did, um, I guess I should talk about the larger project that I'm working on. Um, I'm working on in the nonfiction space, which is what I focused while, on while here is a uh, book of nonfiction about my family and our family stories, uh, particularly um, Native American stories that have not been told, not part of the archive, and uh, you know, we talk about disappearing history and thinking about these um, family stories that whether or not they were dramatic or tragic or just every day, I felt like they, um, they kind of no one is keeping the, a record of these stories and I think that they, they matter to, to talk about. So one thing that I did before I came here was I sat down with my mom and uh, we gathered a bunch of photos and instead of like, I, I feel like when it comes to family history, we each bring like our own narratives about what happened and you know, who was there and I have my own preconceptions about all of that. So talking to my mom and just giving her the mic and saying like, okay, what do you see when you see this picture? Was really um, illuminating for me as one way into this sort of like vast topic of how do I write the whole history of my family? Um, so starting kind of picture by picture, person by person was one inroad into that. And um, we are, we come from two tribes, the Iowa and the Oto, Missouri and uh, their ancestral lands are, as the names would imply, uh, Iowa and Missouri. But through um, you know, forced displacement, were eventually relocated to Oklahoma. Um, but there was a period which I found in my research during which that they uh, lived in Kansas. So would have been in Kansas thinking that, okay, this is their new home. And so kind of when I'm in the Prairie Reserve, it's or even just driving through the, these roads, these beautiful roads, is definitely something that I think about, is how would my ancestors have encountered this land and thought about this land? Um, yeah, and what, one other thing, I guess I've sort of touched on this already, is but I feel like I'm really in the, like, the springtime of this project of understanding what form this will take, and I think that's one thing that the artist residency has been really beneficial uh, to me, to have that time and space to work with material, um, sometimes like writing directly to a photo or sometimes drawing from uh, conversations with my family members or from my own memories. So having that freedom has been, uh, been great. And one thing that my mom said when we were sitting down talking about this, she, was, she said, um, I'm really honored that you know, we get a chance to talk about our, our stories. So just wanted to include that. Um, and so yeah, this is my grandmother uh, growing up on, uh, in, in Oklahoma, in, uh, near Perkins, Oklahoma. And um, I love this photo because it shows, uh, this would have been like in the 30s during the depression, but I feel like whenever I look at these pictures, I, I see the, like, the joy that they had together and the creativity and the fun and um, again it's easy to have preconceived narratives of like what it was like but I think looking at the pictures it's like it's uh, there's different layers of experience that I think are happening all at once um, 
So if you don't mind, I'll read a couple of the things that I've been working on. And these are, uh, these are works in progress. Um, my grandmother waitressed at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, where she met my grandfather. She had two marriages behind her. Frank, her first, was killed, the other she left, and four children. I have exactly one audio recording of my grandmother's voice in which she remembers how my grandfather, a World War II Navy vet and chef who worked in the kitchen, a white man, would keep a hunk of cheese on the chrome countertop. He'd take a big old cleaver, her words, slice it up, and serve my grandmother with a spread of crackers. Her first two husbands had been native. My grandfather reminded her of Frank. They had the same build. Same audio recording. My grandmother tells me that her family was once allotted 80 acres in Payne County, Oklahoma. We are driving through the fields of her childhood, down the flattest road I've ever known, past Indian land our family members once owned, to a cemetery where our relatives are buried. Little by little, those 80 acres, itself already a dwindled inheritance, transformed, became through trades the narrow red house in Stillwater that my family called the Magic House, which later, when rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis and my grandmother's knees made walking untenable. She swapped for a single story ranch home in a new development. After my grandmother's death, that house was sold. The allotment's final form, disinheritance. This is by design. Okay. What my mother sees, a family scene, Easter dinner at a restaurant in rural New Jersey, Left to right, my uncle Skip married to my Aunt Rochelle. Grandma in the center, smiling at the table. My mother, not contented, beside her brother, my Uncle Jimmy. Or sorry, my mother contented beside her brother, my Uncle Jimmy. Not pictured. Grandpa, my mother remembers, who was helping a friend of his start that restaurant. What I see. The various fates fanning out across the table. Of the five seated, three are no longer with us. The two who are alive, my mother and Rochelle, no longer speak, haven't spoken in years. What separates the living from the dead and what separates from the living from the living? Just how much is unbridgeable? The photo's composition holds its own secrets. My mother sits wedged between her own mother and brother, while Rochelle leans into an unseen future, her arm wound around her husband. He would only live to his 50s, Rochelle long gone to his life by then. Then there's my uncle Jimmy with his long hair and his mustache looking squarely and unsmilingly at the camera. He would die at age 27 in questionable circumstances, a hit and run in Albuquerque. I was not born yet and would never meet him. He seems in this photo to hold no illusions. About halfway through my residency, I'm convinced I've connected with some spirits. Not a specific one, not even a specific energy, simply the sense of not being alone, though I am walking in the prairie and have not encountered a single person. I'm inside the bunkhouse and I hear coyotes howling as if surrounding. I go outside and see Jupiter, see inside the same sky my ancestors and not long ago would have seen while living in Kansas before another forced relocation to Oklahoma. To share this meadow with bison is a gift, to see grasshoppers and snakes and several types of tall grass. Someone asked me lately where I'm growing roots. If you think the prairie is flat, you've never been here. If you think the prairie is empty, you have not been paying attention. Thank you. All right, we have another scheduled break time, but don't move quite yet because, is Bill back? Oh my gosh, there he is. <laughs> well, you're wearing the slide anyway. I was worried about finding it again, but I want to invite Bill McBride to talk a little bit about the organization Matfield Green Works, which organized the Community Open Studios this morning and does amazing programming um, here in the community. Bill, do you want to share a little bit? Sure, sure. Okay. Oh, thanks for the tall grass residency. We're so excited to have you all here. And personally, it's great to be a host at Matfield Station and meet so many of you and interact during your stay. And um, Matfield Green Works is a nonprofit that is the oldest nonprofit in town among the four, counting the residency. 
it's uh, Pioneer Bluffs, and it's also the school, the school here. So um, there, there's a lot of nonprofits. You can give money to all of us, don't, where you don't have to discriminate. But uh, uh, sometimes it was, as all these nonprofits came together, it was a little uncomfortable. Why so many nonprofits? What's going on? But now, and recently we've realized that we're all for a better Matt Field Green. And it's, it's really exciting to have partners instead of competitors. And um, so uh, I would like to introduce our board. Uh, Cindy Hodel, I see. Stand up, Cindy, come on. And Philip Hine. Philip is, is here, no? And uh, Derek Ham, there he's in the back. And Teresa Van Akron, we're all locals, there she is, running for county commission and school, and, uh, and also a, a member of our city council. And who, who's the la who's the, who am I? oh, uh, Diana Wirtz. Is she here? She's a painter and has a studio here in town. And so um, we're, all, we're, a local, uh, we're a local board. Uh, are for a year from about 1915 or uh, yeah, uh, 2015 to 2019, we had the bank and we, we owned the building and it was a great gallery and it was host to the Tallgrass show for, for those years. And, uh, but it leaked and it didn't have a bathroom and no heating. It was really just a box. But its advantage is that it's on the scenic byway. And so I think our angle is that we're reaching out to outsiders. We want people to come to Matfield Green to connect because our mission is to connect people to nature and to each other. And that makes better stewards. It gets people excited about the environment. And um, I just learned yesterday, because we have Matfield Station, Airbnb, that they said that 55% of our visitors are from over 300 miles. So we're really drawing people from all over the country. And they're impressed, they love it here. And it's really connecting them to the land. And we just think it makes for good stewardship. And so that's our sort of big picture. And locally, we want a better town. We're, we're interested in ho uh, housing. We're doing a current initiative with the Department of Commerce trying to get a few houses built. And uh, we're interested in local foods. And this summer we had 18 programs that Cindy was primarily organizing that brought all kinds of people to interesting events here. So we're active. But then the, our real uh, gist now is to get the bank back in operation. And we're going to save that facade, tear down the rest of the building, sort of rebuild the gallery space, add a bathroom, storage room, and a mop room, and a terrace outside. And it's expensive, it's four or $500,000. Excitingly, we have an architect and engineers working on it now, and we're gonna have construction drawings and know actually how much it's gonna cost. We have good grant writers, and we're ready to, we're ready to go. So stay tuned, we're, we'll be communicating. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you, Bill. Let's give one more round of applause for our visiting artist speakers, too. Y'all did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. Anyone want to help me with the current time? I think we're supposed to come back at 5, but I want to, is that good? What time is it? It's 4 minutes past 5. Oh, really? Wait, what is this? What is it 5.15? Five fifteen. Sorry, I forgot my own schedule. Let's come back at five fifteen. We'll start back up then. Thanks, y'all. All right. It's time to find your seats, everyone. <laughs> oh, it got real quiet. That's good. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Uh, for our final speaker of the day. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce her. Uh, the wonderful occasion of Janine and Tony being here with us today happened because of the incredible Joey Orr, who is the Andrew W. Mellon Curator for Research at the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas. 
Joey and Janine have been working together alongside faculty and researchers at the KU Field Station in Lawrence to develop site-specific installations and programming in the prairie, uh, a project titled Hearing. When I learned about this project, I could not pass up the opportunity to reach out and invite Janine to Matfield Green, and I'm so very thankful to Joey and the team uh, for agreeing to facilitate this connection, so thank you. So Janine and Tony is an artist of international acclaim. Uh, she is visiting us here in Kansas today from her home base of New York City. Born in the Bahamas, Janine received her BFA from Sarah Lawrence College in New York and her MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. She is known for her unusual processes, using her body as both a tool and a source of meaning within the conceptual framework of her practice. By way of her body of work, Janine carefully articulates her relationship to the world, giving rise to emotional states that are felt in and through the senses. In each piece, no matter the medium or image, a conveyed physicality is meant to speak directly to the viewer's body. The venues where Janine's work has been exhibited are too numerous to list here in its entirety, but some of the highlights include the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Brooklyn Museum in New York, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, the Hirshhorn Museum in DC, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, Art Institute of Chicago, to name just a few. She has participated in the Venice Biennale, Documenta 14. She is a MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellow, a creative capital artist, and she is represented by Luring Augustine Gallery. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Janine and Tony to Matfield Green, Kansas, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, I just want to say I feel so nourished today and so um, fortunate to be an artist. I mean, I just think it's an incredible thing to get so many different perspectives like we got today, so I want to thank all those that opened their studios and the artists in residence for sharing so beautifully about what they're thinking about. Um, so I want to talk to you about listening, uh, and I want to talk to you about our amazing bodies and what it means to live, live from an embodied place. So to start, what I would love you to do is to check out the ears of the person next to you. I mean, look carefully. <laughs> Pull your hair back so they can see. As, as a sculptor, I'm kind of amazed by this part of the body. When you think about it, it's really articulate. Maybe one of the more articulate parts of our bodies. And to think about your ear as something that the form traps sound and, um, and pushes it into a place uh, is kind of amazing. So let's try something else. So would you close your eyes? Joey? Sheena? Kate? Okay, let's open our eyes and try that again. Joey? Sheena? Kate? So, it's interesting how sound locates the body in space. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but having two ears is one of them. Because your body can identify where it hears the sound first. So it can tell the difference between sound that's traveling from Sheena to this ear and the difference of it coming to this other ear. And that tells you where Sheena is. But we also have our ears are at a particular angle to the head. 
right? So when Joey, do it again, Joey. You know that's coming from behind you because of the way the sound is traveling towards your body. So um, I've been pretty excited about these things <laughs> um, and thinking a lot about the way we hear sound and, and then what it means to be a good listener, right? And how much, like how we, we the thing we know the most is our senses. We, we understand the world through our senses, but very few of us know how they work. Um, so I find that kind of interesting. So before I started, um, I want to say that I'm going to show you, like, I'm in the middle of a huge project, and it has, it's going in so many different directions, and it's really not mine. Um, it's taken so many people to make, and so I just wanted to, people, beings, um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of that. Uh, so that's what the, this slide is about. But let's go back to the ear. Okay, let's try again. Am I doing this wrong? We gotta get this. That's right, right? On the right side? It's okay. Oh, did you do that? Sneaky, okay. Um, so, do you remember back to grade school? Is that <laughs> how, how it works? Well, this, I'm going to give you a really rudimentary version because it is super complicated. So, this shape is a funnel shape and it is directing the sound into the ear. That's hitting your eardrum, remember this, and your eardrum is vibrating. When it vibrates, it is causing three, the three smallest bones in your body, tiny little bones, and they're going, you know, one is moving the other. And, um, and then that is going into these, see these three hoops? They're kind of like your body's level. So, so those three hoops and the cochlea is filled with liquid and these little hairs, remember the little hairs? And when you, if you spin and you know you stop, the world keeps spinning, right? And that's because those hairs are telling you what has happened. So we have this way, so I guess my revelation, which is, you know, maybe not a big deal, but seemed like a big deal when I got it, was that not only do, do we hear sound in the way we just experienced it, and that tells us where we are in space, but if I turn my head over like this, the liquid turns over and I know space this way, right? So it's not a mistake, I think, that our hearing and our balance are found in the same place. So, um, so I'm in the bathtub, and I'm trying to learn about the ear, and I'm listening to all these like kids' animations of how the ear works, and they talk to me, then they say something about the labyrinth. And I have already come up with this idea that I somehow want to use, take the anatomy of the ear and turn it into a labyrinth. And I'm like, wait a second. And I rewind, and there is a part of our ear that's called the labyrinth. So I just wanted to show you this labyrinth in France because that's what most people think of when they think of a labyrinth in Chartreux. And you can keep going. So this is my, um, my labyrinth of the anatomy of the ear. And that brings me to the fuel station. So um, uh, how did it work? It's a long story. But <laughs> Joey asked me to do a project. I came up with this idea of the air labyrinth, and we ended up at the field station, and they um, really have embraced the idea. So we set about trying to put this labyrinth into a field at the, at the, at the entrance of the KU field station. So um, I had this thought that... Um, that the most interesting thing that I could do is to try to combine what I wanted to make as an artist in a space where 
the ecologists at the field station were doing the kind of thing that they do there anyway. So very naively, I spoke with the ecologists at the field station and I said, who wants to do an experiment in my piece? <laughs> and they were like, uh, you know, and then I, I learned some obvious things, which is that when you, there's certain protocol for science and replication is one of it and, um, and putting a bunch of bodies walking through your experiment is not the best way to do science. Um, it disrupts everything. <laughs> so that was a revelation, right? We, we want to... We want to know about the land, we want to protect the land, but to protect the land we have to keep the bodies out of the land. And then there's a sort of pro problem there. So I thought, can, you know, still adamant, can we do this um, something to the land so that when people are coming into the piece that they can live its transformation? Because we know that that's how we we form relationship with the land by being any relationship we have in our lives, really, by spending time together, by witnessing all the, the, the journey of the person, the place, and, um, and partaking in it. So how can we be in the land and um, not be an invasive species? <laughs> so that's a big question. So uh, you could go back a second. So, um, Sheena Parsons, who's from the field station, uh, said to me um, that she would be willing to help me do or to do a gentle prairie reset. So not something that would be very dramatic to the land, but to start to remove the invasive species and encourage the natural prairie plants to come back. And so... That was a very exciting moment in the project. Um, but then she said, the first thing we have to do is burn the field. Okay, so I have to explain that I come from the Bahamas. I know mangrove, I know nothing about prairie, and I was like, what, we're gonna burn the field? Uh, uh, for you, that's probably a pretty obvious thing to do. So I started to learn why you burn the field. Um, and I was super excited and I said, well, this is something for people to really experience because then they will start to, what a dramatic way to begin to have a relationship with that plot of land. So I thought that we should do some kind of commemoration, ritual, ceremony that, you know, because burning, that's sort of, we know, we know fire that way. Um, so what I did is I, what Sheena explained to me is that we have, you know, the burning will help get rid of uh, or suppress some of the invasive species. So I started first, I mean, the first thing I learned about were the invasive species, which are quite fascinating, actually, because of their history. And so I thought, okay, it's a fire, we need to let go of something. And I asked everyone that came to the field if they could identify in their life what their invasive species was. Something that might have served them at one point in their life and no longer serves them. And that we would use the fire to let that thing go on a personal level. And in the, in the perspective of the field, we would let it go ecologically. And then I said, okay, now choose your favorite prairie plant. And we're going to do a ritual together. So the morning of, we called up a bunch of people. They came down. And um, this is Theo Michaels and Joey Orr. And they went out foraging bouquets of invasive species. So after people uh, identified the invasive species in their life, I taught them a little bit about what was really taking over in the field. And I wrote these little character sketches <laughs> of the invasive species so that they could pick the one that they felt connected. So each person did that. You can keep going. So this is the bird's foot trefoil. This is the Ceresia. That's Haley holding Ceresia. 
This is the really bad one that we love dearly, Johnson grass. <laughs> and that's me holding some Johnson grass. So we all took our bouquets and walked out into the field. And I had said, oh, I wish I had time to create some receptacle for our invasive species. And when I had come back, um, Sheena Parsons did make made a great gift to me. <laughs> she made this basket out of red eastern cedar, which is another invasive species. So I said to Sheena, okay, so they told me this dramatic story, I don't know if you know, but you burn a field in a circle, and then you, may, and then you create a firewall. <laughs> I'm looking at Sheena because I want to get it right. And then that means that the fire can't go out, right, and burn the woods down or whatever. It can only go forward. And they kept saying, it's going to be very dramatic. It's going to hit in the middle and it's going to, you know, explode up in the middle. And so I was, like, excited for this moment. And I was like, okay, Sheena, we've got to put the basket in the spot. And Sheena's like the breeze and she's trying to figure out what the middle is and so she's like in the field with the basket and we're trying to be very ceremonial and serious and she keeps changing the place and <laughs> finally we did three circles in one direction three circles in the other and put our basket down each person went up and put their invasive species in it um, then we made a circle we turned out to the field. Each person individually called in their prairie plant. Um, we touched the earth and we said thank you. And then we began to burn the field. So um, to our surprise, or to my surprise, the, the Sheena and the field station allowed um, the common folk to actually do the burn. And each of us had somebody from the field station with us in case we did something stupid and hurt ourselves. <laughs> so I was feeling very tough with my, um, with my drip torch and we began to burn. And this is creating that firewall with water and rakes and then the dramatic fire. And so, okay, so this is happening and I, there was this moment that they told me about that I still don't understand that was the most magical moment, which is that the fire races towards itself. It's like attracted to itself. It's like running towards itself. And it runs right over our basket and like goes just to the other side of it. And then the smoke appears and there's our basket in the smoke. And then about two minutes later, the invasive species takes, goes on fire. So we see this fire coming out from the middle of the basket. Very dramatic, we didn't quite catch it, but you have to take my word, it was very exciting. So then, Sheena let us go back into the field after it was burnt. So we all walked back into the field and to our surprise, this circle that we had walked only six times was very clearly left in the field. There's a few reasons for it, the field was wet and the the grass was laid down and then the fire jumped it. But um, there was another surprise, which is when we went back there, we had inadvertently made a circle around a vole's nest. And there were all of these little paths that kind of went out in this sort of uh, spider webby way. And then the deer, paths were also there. So all of a sudden I started to think that this was like a big canvas or drawing and that the animals had made their drawing on the field and then we had made our drawing um, and these drawings were starting to layer on top of each other. And then I started to think about my labyrinth as like a, a kind of game trail, you know, like the deers move in a certain way for a reason and the moles and then the humans have <laughs> this other weird idea about walking in the shape of an ear. <laughs> so um, here's the basket. It didn't completely burn, but its bottom burnt out. And um, here we are at the end of our ceremony where we put our hands in the ash and we thanked the fire. And then we rubbed each other's ears and reminded each other to be better listeners. The next day it snowed. <laughs> so um, I came back uh, 
many months later, and uh, we started to prepare to put the air into the field. So this is me trying to map this out in New York, which was impossible. Um, and we connect, so we connected with um, Design Build at KU, which is the architecture department, and we worked with Keith van der Wright, and he allowed us to work with his students to draw this grid into the field. So this is Sheena with the, um, a very old instrument used to find those points in the field where we're gonna put it. And then the next day, um, all of the students came and we made a grid in the field. So about 120 stakes um, in, in a grid. So I don't know if you can see it there. Can you see it, those little pink ribbons? Um, so it's a pretty large work. And then the next day, um, Joey Sheen and I started to build the air into the field. Um, and then we invited people to come and walk it. So my idea is that there is no real marking to the piece, that as soon as we establish the path, I'll remove the stakes, and the piece will only remain if people continue to walk it. And so in a way, it's like, uh, yeah, everybody is making the piece if they come out and walk it. And they are allowing someone else to experience the piece because they're making the path. So uh, Keith came with a drone, and to our surprise, it actually looks like an ear from above. <laughs> or I should say to my surprise. Um, so there will be no way to get above this piece, right? So you'll never be able to um, see the piece from above. So I was trying to think about some way in which you could experience your anatomy um, because a lot of us don't know what happens once you get past the ear canal. Um, so that when you're walking, you could somehow find, your, find yourself in your own anatomy, that you could be walking through your inner landscape and the outer landscape at the same time and hopefully figure out a way to connect those two things. So um, we are, you could go back a second. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not telling you anything, but you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> and also, you're making me not talk too much, which is great. <laughs> uh, so, so this is just clay, and what I did is I, I drew uh, the anatomy of my ear with my finger. It's called a finger labyrinth. They do exist. And so um, my thought is that we get a big stone, maybe limestone or quartzite, we can't, I can't decide, I keep changing my mind because they have different meanings. If you know your stones, uh, you know that. And um, what we're gonna do is carve that into the stone and have it at the entrance of the piece so that um, people can come and experience it with their finger and then walk into the land and feel it in their bodies. One thing I should say is that the, um, the labyrinth is going to go across three different kinds of um, uh, types of, of, what do you call that? The field, we'll be in the field, we'll be in the woods, and then we'll be on another field on the other side of, um, of the woods. So you will be, you'll, the physicalness of Traversing that, those different kinds of landscapes will be definitely felt in the body. I hope that's the plan. But we've only done the outer ear for, for now. Um, so one thing I want to say uh, is that, you know, this is a really interesting piece for me and very, I feel very privileged to be working both with Joey at the Spencer Museum and the field station because um, they are able to be loose enough to, for us to be able to respond to the land. So there's no time when this piece will be done. Um, and of course now we begin to um, work with 
trying to push the land into a more healthier grassland. So that could be many years in the making. And we think that we're probably gonna do it along the path. So the prairie plants will now, like the humans did, start to define the path. And then they will do what they do and we will watch and partake. So, um, so that's the, what we did. <laughs> um, but now I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ideas behind the piece. And I thought the best way to do that is to call Sheena and Joey up here because you might ask me some questions that I can't answer. So we'll have an ecologist and, um, and a curator that can, um, and we can talk about some of the broader issues of the piece. Are you up for coming up here? <laughs> How should we do this? Should we be on the stage? Do you want to sit on the edge of the stage? What's the best way? Do we want cheers? Yeah, I, I like that too. Okay. Okay. You can grab that mic too. Or do we want people to ask questions with that mic? We can share this one. Oh, come over here, Joey. Up here. Oh, this might be bigger. Oh, you want to walk around? It can be more. Don't. Listen, after I've seen the things you do, <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> is the projector going to blind you? Oh, and we need, to, we, we need to see people walking, so, yeah. Maybe we have to come over here, Joey. Come over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. See how we work together? Yeah, <laughs> great teamwork. Like, sometimes it's a comedy. <laughs> well... <laughs> can we can we say thank you first before we move into the Q&A? Oh, sure. And yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, before we go into the questions, I just want to ask these two, two a question to just get us started. So can you uh, explain your perspective and um, airy and artists as um, researchers, you know, the thing I always make you do. Can you do that again? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Janine has me trained now. Um, so yeah, my, um, I, have a, I have a sort of unique curatorial role at, the, um, at KU, which is to serve the research community. And um, the idea is that artists, um, well, I should say artistic practice is a research method. Art is a way to know the world in as much as the sciences and humanities are a way to know the world. And so we take that very seriously at the Spencer Museum of Art. And so when we find out what the real research priorities are um, across the university, we bring artistic voices into those. Um, one way that I've heard this talked about in um, biological circles is a thing called the critical zone, which is like bedrock to treetop or something. And there isn't a scientist that can address all of that. You have to work with your adjacent colleagues, right? And we feel that artists also should be part of those conversations. If we're going to solve like the really complex problems of the world, we need robust perspectives. And that should include the artists. So that's what I do and that's where the project originates. But of course, none of this is possible without um, interlocutors who believe in, in this kind of work as well, which is why we're um, sort of in partnership with the field station right now. I have so many questions for you. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I just wanted to know why the field station said yes. <laughs> That's one question I have. Um, another one is like, uh, you know, I have to say, Sheena, these are collaborators. We've been in it together in the hot field for days. Um, and we meet every week and we talk and talk and talk. And so now you've seen us like trying to make decisions. And so I'm just wondering what that might look like from, from the science perspective. Well, so I guess I'll say, I mean, I feel like it's a, just such a privilege to work with researchers from so many different disciplines. And to me, like artists are the same as scientists. Like we're all exploring different questions and we think about these places that we're in in different ways. 
And as like a land manager or a practitioner, as a scientist, I think this is such a beautiful partnership because like you force us to think about the space in different ways. Um, we have different perspectives, but like when we're trying to repair lands or like improve the health of a system or something like that, I mean, like it's a, it's a response to the place, right? And so we're learning as we go too and watching things like grow and change through our inputs. And so I guess to me, like, I mean, of course we're gonna say yes. And as like scientists, like it's exciting to see through that different lens, like the landscape. Um, and have you also help us tell a story that scientists sometimes are very horrible at communicating? <laughs> so, um, I mean, we, we all care, it's just in different ways and we're just using different language to sort of tell that story. So I guess I forgot to tell you that um, this week we're going to be giving tours in the labyrinth if you want to come. Um, we have eight ecologists and one doctor who knows about the ear <laughs> that is going to take you through and show you what's in the field right now. And um, there'll be many different perspectives. So. Um, yeah, I would love to know if you have some questions for any of us, all of us. If anyone has a question, I will come to you. All right. I have a practical question. How long do you expect this to live? And how much traffic is necessary to maintain it? Because I know that if, you, if it just grows, it's going to disappear. And so uh, is that in your budget to hire people to walk the path <laughs> to keep it going? <laughs> I mean, this is a question we come to again and again, should it last? Um, and, and there's very beautiful things about letting it go back to the land. Um, what we learned is that when you, when you compact the earth like that, it leaves, it leaves a scar even if it grows over, you know, like when we saw the burn, like the, that, I mean, if you think a little vole can leave its path, um, so, I think it's interesting to, uh, uh, for the piece to last as long as people want to walk it. Um, I'm also aware that uh, we're making a story um, that people will look out on that field and somebody will be around to say, there once was an ear there. <laughs> And like, uh, I feel like we know about the land because of those kinds of stories. Um, so I'm also aware that as we do things, we're, we're making stories and that the field is also making the story. Like it's, I mean, that's why I'm hoping that it will be interesting to those at the field station because nobody has tried to restore a prairie I mean, even the idea that you plant in curves rather than in a grid. But plants grow in curves, they don't grow in grids, for instance. Anyone wanna take that on? I mean, maybe you should talk about that because I feel like we had this most amazing um, text exchange about ephemerality and the land. Do you have something to say about that? Well, so, I mean, this is, this is kind of, this is a curiosity that we have too. Like this is the first game trail that we've created. And so um, as we now know that drought conditions lend itself to establishing, to establishing paths readily. And so um, in a wetter year, that may be a little different when plants are rebounding. Um, the, the time between visitors might, we may need more frequent travelers to maintain the field in those conditions. And so I will say that this is located at one of our established public trailheads. And so the hope is that we would have visitors throughout the year that will help to maintain the peace. And um, we will have some uh, coordinated programming within the, the labyrinth itself too so that we can encourage people to continue to come and experience this place as well to try to like have the longevity that we want yeah and and maybe the question is like 
I'm interested in this question from each of you, like what, what piece of land is meaningful to you and why? You know, and I, when I'm asked that question, I go back to my childhood. I go back to a time when I was, you know, just free in the land. And those, like, I just took my daughter back to one of those places that was important to me as a child. So I'm interested in that. Like, um, if people spend enough time there, will they form attachment and care about the land? And of course, you know, I want them to care about my peace, but I want them to care about the land. So this is just an experiment in how to um, create that kind of relationship. You want to say something or another question? I mean, we can take another question if someone has one. Other questions? Um, something I really appreciate about your work is the focus upon listening. And it just seems like we're in a time now where it's so critical to listen to each other and to listen to the land. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, um, I would love to speak to that. So, um, I mean, it, listening did come to me mostly in a very like during COVID, during a heightened social justice moment. I mean, I was really thinking, no, I was like, nobody's listening to each other. But my dedication to embodiment, which is something that I've spent many years thinking about and trying to live, okay, as I say that, I'm uncrossing my legs, um, live in my body <laughs> and feel grounded. And the more that I, the more that I, learn about that, the more I realize that my body is in a place. And to be in my body, I have to be in a place. Um, and I think that our culture is, is very disembodied, and we kind of live in our heads, and our body is just a vehicle to, think ar to carry around this thinking mind, which is full of desires and there and going after them and we're just driving our bodies in this way and not using them for their deep wisdom and knowing. Um, and that has to do with that kind of listening. Um, and so I feel like if we exploit our bodies for the sake of these ideas, then we're going to exploit other bodies and the land. So I think if we come back into our bodies into place, then we'll change our relationship, and that could be good for all of us. Someone else? Some question? Yeah. Um, uh, this is mostly for Sheena. Um, w are you concerned at all about um, the more people that visit, the more chance of like invasives coming back to the field? <laughs> is this a worry or concern? So invasive species are a really interesting topic to study. I mean, as humans, like, in such a mobile society, I think it's probably nearly impossible to prevent other organisms from coming and going as well. We kind of carry them in, and um, so it's really, I guess I would say I'm not, I'm not too concerned. Um, the location that we chose this piece to be in, I mean, it's, it's a post-agricultural field. It was, um, it left agri like a uh, row crop and entered CRP and it, that's sort of in its history. It's been hayed occasionally after the CRP contract expired. So it's already got a lot of trauma and a lot of invasive species issues to start with. So our hope is we're kind of targeting um, some particular um, less desirable species and trying to sort of um, redirect the, the balance of species out there, hopefully to promote more of the desired prairie plants in there. Um, and so we're spot treating and we'll kind of, I mean, it's a, it's a very interactive experience, invasive species management. So like we'll be watching the fields and managing um, 
and then trying to overseed and sort of encourage different species. So um, I don't, I don't think that there's there's bound to be another player that comes in, but we'll just <laughs> as each comes in, we'll we'll figure it out. At least that's the hope. And having people there and present to experience those things too, and so we're hopeful to really have that sort of narrative documented too, so it can kind of explain what's happening along the process. And so that also helps sort of people who aren't immersed in this world to understand sort of that conservation side of things too. And, and maybe they'll help us do the work. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in it, like uh, that we do the restoration from the path out, mm -hmm. right? So that we can work from the path and then I, I have a vision in my mind of what that will look like when we take our next drone photo from, that's for sure. Uh, was one of the reasons we got permission to do this here is because it wasn't um, under any kind of active experiment. And um, it wasn't really being treated actively by um, the staff at the time. But even so, in order to do work at the field station, you have to submit an application, for a research application, essentially. And in the research application, you have to name your methods and your materials. And so um, the methods that we explicated in the application was um, place-based research, which is obviously what happens at field stations, and also artistic research, um, which is to say, instead of starting with a question or theory and then testing it, you're starting with the artistic practice, which then gives rise to theories and questions. And one of the things that's come up since Janine has started her practice out there is the question, can humans be something other than destructive? Um, and this is really, I mean, I think a central and really important question right now. And just as an example, um, we actually have um, a graduate fellow with us who's working on the project here. Suzanne, can you raise your hand so everyone can see you? Um, and she's also working, working with Keith Vanderreet, who does the design, build, and architecture. And one of the important research questions for Keith is, can we make a, something like a human-built environment that increases instead of decreases biodiversity? And so it's not, it's the artistic questioning, it's the questions of the ecologists and the architects, and it's really sort of a, as I was trying to explain before, taking a very complicated question and bringing in enough perspectives that we might actually maybe move the needle at some point. Thank you so much. I, I hate to cut off good conversation here, but I want to be mindful of our schedule so that we can um, move us along towards evening activities. Um, so I think I might wrap us up here for now, but you all are sticking around for at least a little bit, right? If you want to have more conversation. Okay, Absolutely. wonderful. Great, thank you so much, all three of you for being here. Thank you. Also, there are still openings for those tours, right? So people can sign up. Do you want to? Uh, on the card, that? sorry, on your cards, there's a QR code you can scan. There are still some slots available, but also um, that will take you to the main web page. And she's coming back in the spring, and we're doing more tours. And so, if you just want to follow the project generally, that's how you do it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, good, we did that. Okay. So here's what's happening next. We need you to vacate this space for a little while so we can reset for the dinner line. So you will have the pleasure of hearing some music by Kelly and Diana Wirtz and Susan Mayo, and they are set up outside the school building, uh, just out front of the main doors here. So enjoy that. We'll come and tell you when dinner is set up and ready. Should be around 6.30ish. Uh, that is uh, by suggested donation of $15, but if you don't have cash, you can't do that, no problem. We want you to stay and eat with us, okay? We're gonna be set up in here for dinner in just a little bit. We'll see you back here. We'll enjoy some music from Ryan Klassen, and then later this evening we'll have a bonfire out by Timber Arches. Woo! Thank you all for coming. Thank you.